guys, we're in Luke 15, and we're in this uh, chapter, which has a, a sort of a, a triptych of parables. You've got the lost sheep, you've got the lost coin, and you've got the lost son, as it's normally described. Now, what's going on? Well, we're answering the question, um, the objection really that people have, one of the real reasons why people, it seems to me, seem impressed with Jesus, but don't commit to following him. An objection people raise, it goes like this. You want me to follow Christ with you, but I don't like the people he's got with him. There's some reason, perhaps there's some experience I've had, perhaps there's something in my past that leads me to think, I don't want to be part of those people, I don't need to do with that. Something they do, whether it's some ancient rite, whether it's some image they have, whether it's some unacceptability to me, of the people who follow Jesus. And that's a very, very, very immensely common objection to actual people following Jesus. And sometimes, of course, it's because Christians behave badly. It happens. And even good people do bad stuff. Maybe it's because Christians have sort of had emphases put to them or picked up emphases or have got hobby horses or whatever. Maybe it's that. Maybe it's that, you know, sin has reared its head in the church of God. Maybe it's that Christians are not cool and the boot's on the other foot and somebody's saying, you're not cool enough for me. But this objection for a whole range of complicated reasons comes up. You want me to follow Christ with you, but I don't like the crowd he's got with him. That is not a new objection to following Jesus. That is not something that's happened since the 60s or the 70s, or the 80s, AD, right? that is something that is there in Scripture. And there are these three famous parables in Luke 15. Jesus tells the three of them in just one chapter of Luke's Gospel to address the issue. And he doesn't address it the way so many of us seek to address it, as churches in the 21st century. We're going to get to that. You want me to follow Christ with you, but I don't like, don't like the crowd he's got with him. And there's the tax collectors, and there's the teachers of the law. And between the two of them, they look at one another, and what they see is an acceptable person following Jesus. Now please notice that to make that objection, there's an underlying presupposition to this objection. This objection to following Jesus is that in the absolute sense, you're either a sinner or a saint. And generally speaking, the way those words are used is to misunderstand the way they're used in Scripture for certain. Generally speaking, it is the group of people known as them that are sinners, and the person known as me, or at best us, that are categorised as saints. Right? And people start to get to throw brickbats at one another. It's a pretty large misunderstanding in any event. Because as far as Scripture is concerned, we're all sinners. Aren't we all sinners? Yes, we're all sinners. And the trouble with the Church of God is there's only sinners to make it out of. But some of that universal category of sinners are being transformed, sometimes quickly, sometimes slowly, into saints. Just hold that thought while I shoot off at the tangent. Have we come across cool Christianity? This is one of the responses we get out of the 21st century Western evangelical churches to this objection. People object to us for one reason or another. What we need to do is be cool. Well, hang on. You can't make Christianity cool. Two reasons in the main. The first is that you're trying to make Christianity pleasing to a world that is fundamentally unacceptable to God. And then, that's a kite that won't fly. And then, the second is you've only got unacceptable and imperfect people, sinners, to do church with. And then on top of that, God has declared this is the way he wants to do it anyway. He wants cool and uncool and whatever else you've got in his church, because when God builds church, he does it motley. So what we need to do then is to build a clearer view of Christianity. Not try to make Christianity seem cool. If we're going to object, deal with this objection people have to following Christ, because it is of the glory of the gospel that God builds his church with people who are unacceptable. Does that make sense? Shall I stop now? Is that enough? <laughs> Let's look at Luke 15 and see what we got. 
because the most important Bible passage on this, it seems to me, surprisingly, is Luke 15. It's all about the objectionable people around Jesus. Now, please note this straight away, that there are people around Jesus who are not following Jesus. And we have to say that, because it could be that people are objecting to what they see at church, because in church it's dominated by people who are not following Jesus. That we have to allow for, that is biblical, that we're expected to see from Scripture. There are people around him who are not following him. Similarly, we expect there to be people around church and chapel and religion who at heart are a million miles from him with thoughts, beliefs, ideas and attitudes that match people who are a million miles from him. Now if that's you, that's great, you're welcome. Because church is where you ought to be. Because Jesus has got so much more to say about that than anybody else I know. And he's pretty straight and clear about it too. But Jesus reckons there is something right if dodgy people, people you don't want to come to dinner, come to church. Of course the problem arises if they're dodgy when they come and they stay dodgy. But that's, that's another question altogether, isn't it? So the opening scene... The opening verses of this chapter set the scene very clearly for us. There are people complaining about the sort of people Jesus has got with him, and they're doing that from a position of self-righteousness. You are not cool enough for me to be associated with. I'm better than you. They're objecting to Jesus on the basis of who he's got with him. These people, these teachers of the law, these tax collectors, these Pharisees. The Pharisees and uh, teachers of the law, they're objecting to the tax collectors and the sinners. Because those lifestyles scandalize the Pharisees, scandalize the teachers of the law. Now, of course, in this example, the people objecting so self-righteously are religious self-righteous people. Jesus seems to have no nothing in his day, uh, like in the category that we have, of secular self-righteous. But in so many criticisms we hear in the church and the stuff we see written about God and so on, there is so much that is self-righteous and secular being offered as criticism of the church. So, for example, like a vegetarian friends who will criticise me on the basis that they are holier than Jesus was because you shouldn't eat meat because it's cruel animals. Jesus had meat. God said to Peter, rise Peter, kill me. Not in a cruel sense, not in a cruel way, not sanctioning cruelty in any sense, but saying meat is food. Now that's not to judge those who, for them, their own purposes, wish to say, I wish to be a vegetarian. Not at all. But it is to say, if you try and foist that on somebody else as a standard of righteousness, then you're trying to be holier than God. That is one of the self-righteous, secular criticisms of the church. A small one. A big one, a little small, not a big one, okay? We've got the secular self-righteous, and we've got the religious self-righteous too. Saying, I am holier than that. It's not great. So there's the prologue, the scene is crucially set, we know the problem Jesus is talking about, and to some extent we definitely recognise it. Then Jesus told them this parable, suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one of them, doesn't he leave the ninety-nine in the open country and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? And when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and goes home, and then he calls his friends and neighbours together and says, rejoice with me, I found my lost sheep. Tell you, says Jesus, that in the same way there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous people who don't need to repent. There's an interesting point. Now, now, what's happening here, I don't know if you've noticed this before, but there are three parables. There's the lost sheep, the lost coin, and the lost son. And the first one Jesus tells, the lost sheep, he's telling one for the last. I'll come back to that later, because that's going to be important. He'll tell one for the girls, a very similar effect next, something the Pharisees and teachers of the law will be thoroughly riled by. But first Jesus had a story about despicable shepherds, to make his point. Because shepherds, in, in their view, were dirty people, contaminated by the work they did, and ritually unclean. So Jesus praises up this ritually unclean, unacceptable person to them. Let's give you a lesson using those you find unacceptably beneath you, says Jesus. It's a common lowly scenario that Jesus' is more socially unacceptable followers would identify with but that his more religiously stuck up ones would despise. Here's this despised shepherd in Israel. He's nonetheless a man of means or he works for a man of means because a hundred sheep is quite a lot in that time. They reckon these days you need 1,500 sheep per man to make a living. Ah, yeah. uh, but a uh, <clears throat> hundred sheep 
There's quite a lot in those days. But he's a diligent, he's a careful shepherd because although he has 99 other sheep, he nevertheless leaves the 99 in the middle of his working day out in open country rather than going away from that one lost sheep and, and taking those lot and putting them in the fold of the night watchman before being out to search. He goes straight away and he searches for that one lost sheep. He's serious, he's urgent about caring for the whole flock because it is the isolated sheep that is most vulnerable. And he leaves the big group together because they ought to be safer than the isolated individual sheep. He notices that a sheep lost, and off he goes to search for that lost sheep. Just a quick look in case you can see it. No. He goes after that awkward, annoying sheep until he finds that awkward, annoying sheep. And he pointedly brings that awkward, annoying sheep back into the nice 99 who are behaving nicely and, and, and doing the right things. Being like sheep. And finding that one lost sheep fills the shepherd with joy. Mad joy. When he finds it, joyfully puts it on his shoulders. Verse 6, he goes home. Then he calls his friends and his neighbours together and he says, Rejoice with me, I found my lost sheep. And everybody else will be saying, that's why I'm taking the mat on Monday, going to call that thing. That's good in the curry. <laughs> Nuisance. Why is it mad joy? Well, it's mad for a number of reasons. What does he do with the sheep when he finds it? He sticks it on his shoulders. Have you ever carried a sheep on your shoulders? Uh, a small one. You shift sheep in a trailer, don't you, Callum? Yeah, it's easier. Yeah. You can stick them on your shoulders, smelly, tick-ridden, dirty things, on his shoulders. What's more, it doesn't say lamb. We've all carried lambs back. It doesn't say that. It says sheep. Sheep. Lost sheep. Wayward sheep. Off the him sheep, sheep, because sheep are supposed to flock. It's what they do, is how they stay safe. So this one has a most unworthy self-destructive streak. It's gone off on its own in the wilderness. And instead of making it walk home, which is, why wouldn't it walk home? Why shouldn't he walk it home? Instead of that, he lifts that sheep onto his shoulders in the heat of the day, because in the cool of the day, the evening, the night, the early morning, they'd be back in the sheepfold, and he carries it back home, doing all the work himself for this sheep that doesn't deserve it. Mad joy. Mad grace. And then he throws a party for all his friends and neighbours because of the lost sheep that he's found and graciously brought home to the fold. Shouldn't God be glad about the unworthy people that God, Jesus has got with him? Of course he should. It's the glory of God that he's got unworthy people with him. Of course he should. So Jesus puts the lesson to the Pharisees and the teachers of the law. And here comes that lesson. Here's the lesson. For everyone who objects to following Jesus on account of the motley crew the Lord's got with him, heaven delights to see motley in the makeup of the church. I tell you, in the same way, there'll be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous people who don't need to repent. Heaven delights to see motley in the makeup of the church, which is why he delights in you if you're prepared to acknowledge Jesus wants motley and repent of your own sins and inadequacies, inadequacies in yourself and be part of the motley bunch. See, if this is your objection to following Jesus, Jesus is clearly in no mind to appease you. Because God's grace is glorious when he plainly does motley budge. Jesus only deals with sinners who will be saved. Who will be saved. The one, these are the ones who heaven rejoices over, not the 99 who consider that they are righteous and therefore don't see any need to repent. I'm not one. Arrogance is a very, very life-sucking sin, isn't it? Okay, well Jesus has illustrated his point for the lads, and now he seems to turn to making the same point in a way designed to appeal to his lady followers. Now that, that is going to get straight up the say who knows it. They're not going to like that at all. The point here is that Jesus welcomed lady followers to the extent that he tells the story they're going to get. He's going to make the same point he made with the thing about the shepherds for the lads, and he's not going to turn to the ladies and he's going to say, Ladies, 
here in the house. And around your neck you're wearing what came with you at your betrothal. You're wearing in the manner of ancient Near Eastern women, you're wearing your bride price in a sort of a, not a necklace, but a sort of a thing that goes here, around your neck. And as you're in your house, you look there, and you see that one of those coins has been lost, and it's hit the floor somewhere, and that is somewhere in the house, where's it gone? You've lost, as it were, your engagement ring. It's not just that this has value, this coin, it belongs to a piece which is of significance to you. The work's done by Bailey and people like that on, on ancient Near Eastern cultural content. And you can just, well, have you lost, have you lost your wedding ring? Have you lost your engagement ring? Well, great, is it? This woman, it's, it's like, you know, it's got to us straight away. And this woman, Jesus is telling this parable about, there are women there who can identify with that straight away. What does she do? Like that shepherd, this woman drops everything, goes to some trouble, the expense of a life, and sweeps through the house, the hard work of it all, meticulously until she finds what she'd lost. And again, she finds it, and what does she do? She calls her friends and her neighbours together and requires of them merriment as she throws them all apart. Rejoice with me. Rejoice with me, verse 9. I have found my lost coin. And then, you come to the point. In the same way, says Jesus... I tell you, there is rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. There's the lesson. The point Jesus wants to make to those arrogant people in verses 1 to 2 who think that they are a cut above and that lies at the, the root of their objection to Jesus' modern career. There's rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. These Pharisees, these teachers of the law, won't admit the truth about themselves long enough to reckon themselves sinners and repent. They'd rather cover up and evade the implication of their own guilt and sin by focusing on the unworthiness and the unacceptability of other people. And that is a common human trait. But there is rejoicing in heaven. God is pleased when one sinner repents. Jesus is not appeasing these objectors on this issue. He is simply calling on them to repent of it. If you're objecting for that reason, shame on your head. So Jesus has told two stories saying pretty much the same thing. One for the girls, one for the boys. And the Pharisees are sort of wriggling already. They don't like that at all. Women followers? What? Unacceptable. Jesus had women followers. This in itself then makes the point to the, to the Pharisees, to the teachers of the law, that God's choice of disciples, his followers of Jesus, would not be the same choice as theirs, because there's women in there for starters. Mm. And now Jesus puts the point on the issue for these people who are objecting that we want them to follow Jesus, they don't like the crowd he's got with them. Basically, Jesus says that taking that position has consequences. Consequences that are going to hurt you. And that's where we get to the parable of the lost sons. First of all, here comes the younger son. Now again, a lot has been helpfully said in the last few decades about the cultural background to this story. But believe me, we're going to keep this simple. Okay? Where is the big picture of what's happening? We've had these two parables that are just the same, and now we've got one that's a little bit different. A little bit different. And the key difference between this parable and the two that have gone before is that the central characteristic is not of searching, but of being lost. The first two parables are about people searching. This last one is about people being lost. Now this younger son's profile looks like this. Dad, give me your money, verses 11 to 12. In any culture, that's wrong, yeah? In an ancient Near Eastern culture, that is absolutely, absolutely outrageous, insulting and unacceptable con conduct. To the extent that it amounts to, amounts to the younger son wishing his father was dead already. You don't do that. And the Pharisees and the scribes listening to him say that will be scandalised. But, but, but then they take heart because they, they think they know where this is going. Because that young man's profligacy with the money 
in a foreign country, squandering it all away, leads him into penury. There he is, penniless. In this foreign country. And he finds himself feeding pigs and longing, longing to be able to fill his hungry stomach with the food he's giving to the pigs. Now, now those, those Pharisees are nothing unclean, ritually condemned, you know, absolutely bottom of the pile. He's feeding pigs and he's longing to eat pig food. The guy is absolutely unacceptable. They will be scandalized. And they're perhaps quite content now to see that this young man is he's offended and God has acted justly because look what's happened to him. He's got his desserts. And then verse 17 he comes to his senses. Here's what happens. When he came to his senses, verse 17, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have food to spare? And here I am starving to death. Now he's got a plan. I'll set up and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. So he got up and went to his father. First thing he gets his head straight, that's the big thing that's needful. A large part of what Jesus is trying to tell these people in verses 1 to 2. He gets a right view of his actual situation. In this case he compares his lot with a lot of his father's servants. And that can be a useful thing to take stock of where you're actually at. He resolves to go back and acknowledge his actual guilt. He resolves to go back and acknowledge his actual unworthiness. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. And he resolves to go back and relinquish any claim to his previous status. Just treat me like one of your hired servants. Now imagine what the older brother's going to do. Imagine how the older brother is now going to make the rest of his life a nightmare. No, he's not concerned with that. Go back to his father. And not only does he resolve all these things and get his head straight in this way, verse 20, he acts on it. He got up and went to his father. And as far as those Pharisees and teachers of the law in verses 1 and 2 are concerned, this is the bit where they might expect the father to protect his own honour by turning his back on that boy. Here's where the guy gets his. But what actually happens is his dad comes running. While he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him and kissed him. And to the scribes and the Pharisees listening to this, this conduct of the father is outrageous. Firstly, no man of any respectability at all in the ancient Near East runs. You don't run. It's undignified to run. You certainly don't get up and pick up your cloak thing, whatever you've got, and run to meet a wayward son. And you certainly don't welcome such wayward characters into your home with rejoicing. Because if you do, the scribes and the Pharisees and the teachers of the law will give you a very different time. This is outrageous. See, what's happened so far is that the lesson of the previous parables is confirmed. God, and he does so quite scandalously to those self-righteous types, God rejoices to welcome back the lost who repent, that, that is, come to their senses, Turn around the direction of their lives and turn back to him. Nothing new there in the context of this chapter. God has spoken out clearly that he rejoices to have people that we might think unworthy in his church. But here comes the twist in the tale. Here's where the story revolves. Because the Lord's parable is not quite finished yet. There's another son. Don't you remember this man has another son? Whose response to God's mercy is quite different. Verses 25 to 32, he is the elder son. He is scandalized to have his kid brother return with joy to sonship in the house of their father. And worse. Just as so many are scandalized by the people that God will have in his church. Here comes the elder son's response. Please note it is utterly self-righteous. He thinks these other people are beneath him. This other son is beneath him. 
But God gladly welcomes that son into his household of faith. And please note, because this is the point, note where this elder son ends up. Verses 25 to 30, here's the point. Here's the objection. Father, I'm a very good boy. I will serve you, but I want to choose who will be here with us. <coughs> so the elder son's in the field when he came near the house. He heard music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and asked him what was going on. Your brother's coming, he replied. Your father's killed the fattened calf because he's, he has him safe, back safe and sound. And the elder brother became angry and refused to go into the house. Now that's a very, very crucial thing. He's refusing to enter his father's house. He's bang out of order <clears throat> in Near Eastern terms. He refused to go in. So his father went out and pleaded with him. But he answered his father, Look, self-righteousness coming to, to the fore, all these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders. Yet you never even gave me a goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours, who has squandered, not my brother, when this son of yours, who has squandered your property with prostitutes, comes home, you kill the fattened calf for him. Notice all human justice is on the side of the brother, the elder brother. But all God's grace is on the side of the repentant younger brother. Yes, he's an unacceptable character. <coughs> yes, God is glorified by accepting him. And the problem people who raise this objection we're considering have with, with God is the extent of God's mercy. Is the extent of his grace. And his acceptance of people that we think are unworthy. Possibly they are. Possibly we're wrong about them. But we're certainly wrong about our assessment of ourselves if we're raising that objection. Because it's extremely self-righteous and arrogant. <coughs> <coughs> Jesus has one more warning to issue such self-righteousness. And that's where the parable ends. That's the point that this triptych of three parables is trying to make. Because the elder son refused to rejoice at the motley that glorifies God's grace. The elder son refused to come in. His father went out and pleaded with him. My son, the father, said, you're always with me and everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours was dead and is alive and he's lost and he's found. And the elder brother refuses to come in to the household of God. The elder son is the son who was lost. Because we need to be open sinners in need of God's grace. Not false saints full of unacceptance of people we don't find acceptable. The elder son is the parable's prodigal and he stays lost. And on that bombshell the parable slams shut. <coughs> See, there's only rejoicing in the father's house over one son. And it's not the one who raises the objection we're dealing with today. <coughs> Jesus doesn't muck about with this. He does not appease the objectors in the slightest way. His message is painfully clear. This is not an objection that he's willing to smooth out with you. And it is not one who'll have his church open to you. He will not have his time to become this for you by making his message or life in his kingdom cool by you. You don't like the people he's graciously chosen to have with him? What make, makes you think that you are any more acceptable yourself? It's an objection according to Jesus. You just need to repent of if you're going to have any chance at all of receiving life by his grace. It's the son who was convinced of his own rightness. Who's the one who ended up in the wrong with God and out of his father's house. Mm. And if that's not a nail in the coffin of cool Christianity, I'm not sure what it is.
seen the eyes and hope.